David Coletta, welcome back. As you continue to uh, take part in our uh, Big Five series this week as a partner in our democracy project, tonight we're talking about battlegrounds uh, and lots to talk about there. But before we get to that, we're going to look at different parts of the country and how they may end up playing a, a key role in the election outcome. Let's talk about uh, the big picture first and sort of the national vote intentions. What are we seeing? Well, we're seeing a very close race. Uh, nationally, again, last week when we asked Canadians how would they vote if an election were held today, we're basically... Well, we're not basically, we are tied. 32% for the Liberals, 32% for the Conservatives, the NDP at 17, the Greens at 9, the Bloc at 5, and the People's Party of Canada at 2%. If we look at some of the, the shifts that we've seen over the last few months, um, you know, at the end of 2018, we showed a close race. The Conservatives uh, were only a point or two behind the Liberals in most of the polling. But there's been some changes in between. So uh, right after um, Jody Wilson-Raybould's testimony, we, we've been tracking uh, vote intention. The Conservatives had opened up a seven-point lead in our tracking right. soon after that. This data suggests it's kind of come back to a point where it's still very competitive. We talked yesterday about leaders and the, the impact it had on Mr. Trudeau's personal numbers, uh, but this is a very competitive race at the national level. Okay, and let's, let's get down into the, uh, the provinces and where the campaign will likely be decided, and uh, they have the most seats and the most voters and the most races to watch. Let's, let's start in the province of Ontario. What's happening there? Well, in Ontario, where there's the most seats, um, we're seeing a very close race. It's mirroring almost the national numbers, right? You've got 35% for the Liberals, 34 for the Conservatives, 19 for the New Democrats, the Green Party at 8%. Uh, again, this is um, slightly down for the Liberals, slightly up for the Conservatives. No huge change over the last few months in Ontario. Um, it's one of the things I'm watching for in this battleground is the impact that Doug Ford, the Premier of Ontario, has on federal politics. He, he's doing some controversial, rather po unpopular things that right. I think have the potential to impact how people view federal politics given uh, his, his closeness with the federal Conservatives. A lot of ways, a two-way battle right now in the province right. of Ontario. Let's move to British Columbia. What are you seeing there? British Columbia is the one region where I think we've seen the most change. Now, I will note, we've got smaller sample sizes, so there is a higher margin of error when we're looking at BC, but we are seeing the Liberal numbers dropping, right? In our, in our latest read, we've got the Conservatives actually uh, well ahead uh, at 37 percent. The NDP is actually in second at 25. The Liberals down to third at 25. We've done a lot of research over the last few weeks. This number has sort of fluctuated up and down for the Liberals, um, but, but the real story here is given that um, you know, the SNC-Lavalin controversy involves a high-profile BC MP and, and Ms. Wilson-Raybould, uh, BC is one of those areas where I think we've seen some impact on Liberal vote intentions. In BC, the fortunes of, of the uh, of the NDP and the Greens could be a factor too, right? Absolutely. I mean, what, watching there, and what do we watch for in the next two two months with those parties? Well, I mean, there's going to be a by-election in on on Vancouver Island that the Prime Minister just recently called. Right. Uh, the Green Party is doing well provincially. The NDP is relatively popular uh, as a provincial government in in BC. And so BC really, out of all the regions of the, of the country, is really a wild card in the sense that there's multi-parties who are competing. And even within British Columbia, there's different regions. So on Vancouver Island, there's a very different right. political landscape than if you go to the interior and the lower mainland. So one to watch, I think, for sure. Well, let's move to the province of Quebec. Uh, we expect that will play, as always, a, a key role in the election outcome. What are we seeing there? Well, in Quebec, interestingly, there's been lots of change or some change in other regions of the country. Um, I think because of how this, the SNC-Lavalin controversy is being received in Quebec differently from the rest of Canada, we do see a very different landscape. The Conservatives um, have, have really not gained much uh, from this. The Liberals still have a large lead over the Bloc and the Conservatives that are, who are basically tied in second. Um, look at the NDP number, 9%. Uh, if you recall, there was a one point during the last federal election in which the NDP was polling at 50% in Quebec. They're now, uh, like other polls are showing in ours, single digits. And look at the Green Party. Yeah, big right? jump for the Green Party. Uh, I guess that's one of the gains. stories to watch, right? If the, if the NDP vote's collapsing in the province of Quebec, where is it going to go? Where is it going and, and who can benefit from, from all those votes? Okay. Uh, what about Max Bernier's People's Party? We saw quickly there. Are they? I mean, he's he's based in Quebec. Uh, is he taking off? Not really. Uh, One percent among uh, our our polls. Um, you know, they, he he maybe gets two, three percent in other parts of the country. We don't see any evidence that there's you know been a lot of momentum coming out of uh, the by elections. A sizable group of Canadians, about one out of five, say they're open to voting for the People's Party. But given that our, our conversation is so polarized between the Liberals, the Conservatives, and, and the, to some extent the New Democrats, Max Bernie is trying to create space for himself, but it, I don't, Haven't not heard. yet, it hasn't been successful. Okay, let's shift to what will drive votes in various parts of the country, including 
uh, the battlegrounds of you know, Ontario, BC, and Quebec that we're watching more closely. What do we see? When we well, we do see a different issue landscape, as we would expect, right? So, for example, if we go west to east in British Columbia, housing is the top issue, particularly those who live uh, around the Vancouver or Victoria areas. Um, cost of living, housing, real concern for people in BC. If you cross the border and the mountains into Alberta, a very different landscape on the economy, the cost of living to some extent, but also we, we added this into our mix, support for oil workers and the oil sector is something that's top right. of mind in Alberta. Uh, further east, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, the economy, cost of living is important there. Healthcare uh, is also important. Uh, into Ontario, again, healthcare and economy, these, it's like there's a, a pattern going on, but housing pops into the top three in, in Ontario, particularly in the GTA area. And then if you go into Quebec, you cross the Ottawa River, uh, you actually get a very different landscape. Healthcare mm -hmm. is the top issue in Quebec, but look, climate change right. pops up to number two in Quebec, very different from other parts of the country. Uh, seniors issues, which are also related to healthcare, important there. And then finally in Atlantic Canada, uh, healthcare is the most important issue in Atlantic Canada. There's been lots of discussion about you know, funding and an aging population in, in Atlantic Canada, which also is, I think, raises people's uh, concern and priority around how do you care for all the seniors uh, who will need care in, in Atlantic Canada. So again, some, some similarities across the country, but also some, some differences region by region. Okay, let's finish up by looking at uh, swing ridings. These are, these are ridings we look at in every election campaign because they, you know, they're, they're, they were close from campaign to campaign, result to result, and they're really the ones to sort of watch to see what people in those ridings are thinking. What might be changing? What are you finding? Well, we, we, yeah, we're able to take a snapshot of the 78 ridings that were won by 5% or less, and we're able to aggregate people who live in those ridings and look at uh, how they voted. We actually know how they voted last time and how they would vote today. And what we see is it's a very close race still. Uh, this is how they voted last time. You can see the Liberals won by uh, eight points over the Conservatives. The NDP did quite well. A lot of these ridings were in Quebec um, and in parts of Ontario that were, were real close two or three-way races, uh, even the Bloc because of the number of, in Quebec. If we look at where these, these ridings are today, um, it's a very different picture um, to some extent. The, the Liberals are down six, the Conservatives are up five to 34 percent, and the NDP is down eight in these ridings. Uh, so it, it does suggest that the Conservatives are benefiting, that in these really close ridings um, th they're doing better, but it also suggests the NDP, which we've seen from some of the by-election results, are, are struggling. Mm -hmm. and, and many of those seats in Quebec that were three or four-way races even, won't likely be that way if the election were held today because the NDP numbers have basically collapsed in Quebec. All right, give some, uh, thank you, David. Gives us an idea of what to watch for, uh, where the ground might be shifting as we uh, are seven months out from a, from, from a vote, and this gives Canadians some important information on uh, what to watch for in, in the weeks ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Peter.